all cell phones and other electronic devices that may talk. We want to make sure you don't disturb your neighbors during the presentation. It's now my distinct pleasure to introduce our first speaker of the day. Dr. Michael Davis of the Retina Institute of California completed his undergraduate and medical degrees through an accelerated program at Kent State University and Northeastern Ohio University's College of Medicine. He graduated summa cum laude with a Bachelor of Science degree from Kent State University. After earning his medical degree, Dr. Davis completed his internship and ophthalmology residency at Rush University Medical Center in Chicago, Illinois, where he served as chief resident. Dr. Davis specializes in the medical and surgical management of many retinal conditions, including diabetic retinopathy, macular degeneration, dislocated intraocular lenses, macular holes, and retinal detachment. He's published several peer-reviewed articles in a wide variety of medical journals, such as the Archives of Ophthalmology, and has presented his work at both national and international conferences. He's a member of the American Academy of Ophthalmology, the American Society of Retina Specialists, and the Association for Research in Vision and Ophthalmology, and many other high-profile professional organizations. Today, Dr. Davis will be discussing diabetes in your eyes, so please join me in welcoming Dr. Michael Davis. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, um, my lecture style is very informal, so if I, I say something that you don't understand or you have a question while I'm talking, just raise your hand and we can answer questions as we go along. I find that answering the questions at the time of the presentation is easier than waiting all the way to the end. Um, but I would like to ask that if you have a, a personal question about your personal health or your personal eye health, um, to hold off on those questions, okay? So uh, this morning we're going to talk about diabetes in the eye, and specifically diabetes in the retina. Now when you have diabetes and you start to develop disease in the retina, the term for that is called retinopathy. So we'll be talking about diabetic retinopathy this morning. Diabetes, there's 16 million Americans in the United States that have diabetes, but only about 50% of those patients actually they know they have the disease. As a retina specialist, it's not uncommon for me to have a patient come to me with a loss of vision or decreased vision, blurred vision, and I look in their eyes and I say, how long have you had diabetes? And they're like, doc, I don't have diabetes. And so oftentimes I'm, as a retina specialist or ophthalmologist, we're the first one to see that the patient has uh, diabetes. And then we get them plugged in with an internist and get them under the care. Generally, um, it takes many, many years to develop the retinopathy. It takes about 20 years um, for both type 1 and type 2 diabetics to develop retinopathy. Uh, type 1 diabetes is also known as juvenile diabetes or insulin-dependent diabetes, and these are generally the kids that get diabetes um, around the age of 10 to 12. Type 2 is the more common, it's the one that you develop as an adult. Um, the, diabetes is the leading cause of blindness in working aged Americans, so it's a, a big problem with disability and uh, patients not being able to work because around age 40 to 50 is when patients start to have problems with the diabetes in their eyes generally. It's more common in African Americans and Mexican Americans, and really the severity depends on the duration of the disease, how well the disease is controlled. Um, the sex and the age. Um, it also depends on not just the diabetes control, but a lot of times patients also have high blood pressure, cl high cholesterol. And if you don't control those other diseases, the diabetes in the eyes can get a lot worse as well. Technical problems. Can you? Okay, sorry about that. 
Um, like I was mentioning at the first part, about half of the uh, patients that have diabetes don't even know they have diabetes. But then the other half of the patients that do know they have diabetes, about a third of those have never had their eye ex examined. And it's very important that all diabetics get a yearly eye exam. Now the timing of when you first do the exam, um, I'll talk about in a minute, is um, generally for type 1 diabetics, um, the recommendation is, these are the kids that present with it, it's five years after they're diagnosed. Now type 2 diabetes, the recommendation is that as soon as they're diagnosed, they get a baseline eye exam. And the reason for this is generally these patients have had diabetes for several years prior to being diagnosed. You also want to watch when you first see a patient with diabetes initially, when you first start treatment, you have to watch them a little bit more closely than you would, you know, further down the line once you know that their diabetes is controlled. And the reason for this is, and we're not sure why this happens, but when patients are being untreated for diabetes and then all of a sudden start receiving treatment for diabetes, their eye disease can progress more quickly. So generally when I first see a patient with diabetes, I you know, the, the recommendation is to see them once a year, but if I see them for the first visit, I usually see them three or four months later until they're, I know that their blood sugars are stable and I know that the eye disease is stable. The other group of patients that can have a rapid increase in the, in the problems in the eyes are uh, patients who are pregnant. So it's recommended that once per trimester and then once right after delivery that uh, pregnant women who have diabetes get an eye exam because they can, you can really see an acceleration of the disease through pregnancy. Now what do patients have when they have diabetes in the eyes? Well oftentimes they have no symptoms at all, which is generally why you recommend that the patients come in yearly and they're saying, well doc, I'm not having any problems, but we have to keep monitoring because as soon as we start to see changes in the retina from the diabetes and institute treatment, that patient may never have symptoms from it. Um, other things that pa patients can get is blurred vision. And they can get blurred vision even just from varying blood sugar. So just because a patient with diabetes has blurred vision, it doesn't necessarily mean that they have retinopathy in the eyes, um, but they may just be having fluctuating blood sugars. Um, they can have some distortion. You can get swelling in the retina, which causes straight lines to look bent or wavy. Um, they might have problems with night vision or reading. And then they may have floaters. These are little black specks in their vision. Um, one of the more common reasons why a patient with diabetes would have floaters in their vision is because of bleeding inside the eye. They can get abnormal blood vessels that burst and then they see the blood floating around and it looks like black specks in their vision. Now diabetes, it's a disease where you have elevated blood sugar and most of the problems that come from that is because of its effect on very small blood vessels. So the places where we see most of the diabetes, um, obviously the eye, because that's what we're talking about today, but also in the nerves. So if you have any friends or know of somebody with diabetes, they may have tingling in their feet or in their hands or numbness in their feet. Um, and then the other place is kidneys. And that's why a lot of patients with advanced diabetes end up on dialysis because their kidneys stop working. It also affects the heart as well. Um, and it's basically damage to these small blood vessels. When the blood sugar is very high, it forms toxins in the blood. It actually forms an alcohol-like substance in the blood that uh, damages the blood vessels. Um, so it leads to decompensation of these small blood vessels, which cause uh, the blood vessels not to be able to carry oxygen to these organs. So in the eyes, we see areas where they're not perfused, they're not getting enough blood flow. And then that leads to other problems like swelling in the retina and then that's also why you get the abnormal blood vessels that grow because when the eye is not getting enough oxygen, it produces all of these chemicals to try to create its own source of oxygen. And these blood vessels that create it, although it's well intentioned by the eye to grow new blood vessels to help itself, but they're actually more like weeds in a garden. They don't bring in more oxygen. They're the blood vessels that lead to bleeding, leads to scar tissue formation in the eye, and it causes a lot of problems. Now, the, there's basically two types of problems that we see in the eye, and it was classified in the 70s and 80s. And it goes by a couple different terms, but it's early diabetes in the eye, it's called non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy, also known as background diabetic retinopathy, or and the second is proliferative diabetic retinopathy. 
Now the main difference between these is in non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy, there's no new abnormal blood vessel formation. That's why it's called non-proliferative. Um, because there's, it's not making new blood vessels. Once the eye starts to make new blood vessels, which can lead to bleeding, that's when it is termed prol proliferative diabetic retinopathy. And then there's also a separate term called diabetic macular edema. And this is just a fancy term for swelling in the retina. It's another one of the big problems that you can get. And that happens because as these elevated blood sugars attack the blood vessels, they become weak and the fluid within the blood vessel starts leaking out into the retina and causes swelling in the retina. So I'm going to show you some pictures of what we see um, when you come into the office. And so I'm going to show you some normal pictures first so you have a little perspective. Now when you go to your eye doctor and they dilate your eyes and look in your eyes with that very bright obnoxious light, this is what we're looking at and this is the retina. Uh, this is the optic nerve. It's this pinkish circle where all these red blood vessels are coming out, and this is normal. This area here, just next to the optic nerve, is called your macula, which is essentially the center of your vision. And this is where a lot of the problems from diabetes occurs, is in the macula. In the very center of the macula is your very fine, fine vision, and that area is called your fovea. Now one of the tests that we do for diabetic patients and other patients with retina disease is called a fluorescein angiogram. And for this test we inject fluorescein dye through a blood vessel either in your, ar or your arm or your hand and that lets us see the blood flow in the back of the eye. So we take more pictures uh, with special filters on the camera so that we can see the blood flow. So you can see here now the optic nerve and then all these blood vessels are filling with the dye. And this is normal. It looks like trees of a, or branches of a tree, and this is normal. And it's also normal that the very center of vision is supposed to be dark because there's no blood flow right in the very center of your vision. So what do we see when patients have diabetes? Well, looking at this picture, you can already see that there's some things in this picture that weren't in the other picture. You get what are called dot blot hemorrhages, and that's all these little red specks in the retina, these are all little, basically little burst blood vessels where the blood vessel, it lost its integrity because of the high blood levels, blood sugar levels, and you get little dots of blood. You may also see that there are these areas that look yellowish in the retina. And this is area where actually it's fat from within the blood that's seeped out into the retina. So this is an area of swelling with the fat that was once contained in the patient's uh, blood system is now deposited in the retina. This is a little bit more uh, severe. As you can see there's a lot more red, so more bleeding within the retina. And another picture again with dots of blood. So how does diabetes at this level, so this is what, again, this is what I call the non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy, because even though there's dots of blood in the retina, there aren't abnormal blood vessels growing. The two big things that we see in why patients at this level have decreased vision are two terms. One is called macular ischemia, and that just means a lack of blood flow to the macula, which is that center part of the vision that I described on the earlier picture. And what happens is as the blood vessels that are feeding the eye are affected by the high blood sugars, they start to shut down. So they leak and they shut down. Once they shut down, you get these areas where there's not blood flow at all and you get abnormal perfusion and loss of vision. And unfortunately, this is a very difficult problem to treat because we don't have a good treatment for macular ischemia or the lack of blood flow. The only thing I can recommend to my patients is keep your blood sugar, blood pressure, cholesterol under control to prevent it from getting worse. The other one is macular edema, which I mentioned earlier, and this is swelling within the retina. So the abnormal, uh, uh, vasculature becomes leaky and it basically is like you have a leaky pipe in your house and your carpet gets wet. Similar to this, your retina is basically full of fluid and full of the fat that was once in the blood vessels. Now the, the swelling in the retina, this is the leading cause of vision loss in patients with diabetes and it's treatable but sometimes at some point it becomes very difficult to treat. Um, and it usually is, like I said, it's right around the center of vision, so that's why it affects the vision the most. It's the leaky blood vessels. And we can see it both on that dye test that I showed you, as well as a picture, another picture called an OCT, 
which is essentially, it basically takes a cross-section picture of the retina, and I'm gonna show you in this next slide. These top pictures, you have a color picture, and then two of the pictures with the dye. And I don't know if you can appreciate it, but if you look at this middle dye picture and then look at the last dye picture, there's a lot more white in the retina in the last dye picture, and that's the dye that's leaked out of the blood vessels. Um, and that's what's causing the swelling. And this picture at the bottom is basically a cross-section picture of the retina. And as you can see, it go, there's like a bump there with these black spaces. So that's fluid within the retina. So this is essentially your wet carpet that's swollen. Now, with time, this type of diabetes, the non-proliferative diabetes, can become the proliferative. So if the blood sugars aren't under good control, the blood pressure isn't under control, good control, it will then progress to the proliferative type of diabetes. And this is when you get abnormal blood vessels growing in the retina, where they grow either on the optic nerve, they can also grow outside of the optic nerve. And these can lead to bleeding in the eye. Bleeding in the eye is called a vitreous hemorrhage. Uh, the vitreous is the gel that fills the inside of the eye, and hemorrhage just means blood. So when the patient has bleeding in the eye, it's called a vitreous hemorrhage. Or they can develop scar tissue, and when they develop the scar tissue in the eye, the scar tissue pulls on the retina and causes retinal detachment. And it's called a tractional retinal detachment because it's the scar tissue that's pulling on the retina, causing it. And both of these can be very serious problems. Yes? Mm -hmm. The vitreous. The vitreous hemorrhage does not cause the detachment, but the scar tissue that develops. So what happens when these new blood vessels grow, they grow with the blood vessels, but they also form scar tissue while they're growing, too. And the scar tissue is what forms the retinal detachment. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. Because when you have the vitreous hemorrhage like this, you know, if you're walking down the street and somebody sees you, they don't see the blood at all. This isn't um, like a blood spot on the white part of the eye, which you can sometimes get. But so this is all within the eye. So yet yeah, somebody looking at you would not know that you had this. They would have to examine inside of the eye. Right. Exactly. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh huh. Are you using any drugs such as the for treatment of Yes. And I'll talk about the treatment in a minute. Yes. Up here first. There is a camera that was just developed by a doctor at USC um, for. It's, for, it's more for retinitis pigmentosa, a different condition, but likely will be used uh, for diabetes and other things as well eventually. Right, I don't, I'm not aware of the cost, but I, knew that, I do know that it was just FDA approved within the last few months. Yes. So you, it can affect other parts of the eye as well. Um, I, I don't go into it in this lecture, but you can develop early cataracts because of the diabetes. And when the diabetes gets very severe, these abnormal blood vessels that are growing on the retina, you can actually get them where they grow on the, um, on the iris, on the colored part of the eye as well. And it can cause a severe form of glaucoma if it gets to that point. Yes. Why are they dry and itchy a lot? Um, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Well, let me talk to you afterwards, okay? Okay. Yeah. Uh huh. Um, 
So the damage to the optic nerve is more difficult um, because you would need to re you need to reconnect it to the brain. Um, and I'm not I'm not familiar with how the camera works. Whether it just stimulates the retina. So if you need a functioning, my understanding is you need a functioning optic nerve for the way that system works. Um, but certainly there's a lot of research going into um, to developing things to help you know multiple eye, eye problems. Yes. Mm hmm Well, there's many different causes of retinal detachment, um, so it may not have been related to your diabetes. So I would, I would ask your eye doctor that question as to what caused it, but there are, there's different causes for retinal detachment. One of them is diabetes, but I can't answer whether yours was from the diabetes or not. It may, be, it may have been from another cause. Um, in these pictures, it's a little difficult to see on the screen, but there's been some bleeding inside of the eye on the picture on the right-hand side. There's a big red blob above the optic nerve, and that's some blood within the, in the center part of the eye. And again, these pictures are showing the abnormal blood vessels, which are a little bit difficult to see, but there are all these stringy red lines here. These are new blood vessels that are growing uh, in the back of the eye. Clicker issues again, sorry. Now these are pictures of the dye test with the proliferative type of uh, diabetic retinopathy. Um, and it's showing that there's areas that aren't getting enough blood flow. So this lower left and this upper uh, right picture is showing there's supposed to be a normal dark area in the center, but this dark area is a lot bigger than what it's supposed to be. So this is what we call ischemia or a lack of blood flow to the retina. And then this picture here, do you see how bright it is on the optic nerve? It's much brighter than what was on the earlier pictures, and these are new blood vessels growing on the optic nerve. The abnormal blood vessels that form because of the diabetes, they're very, like I mentioned, very leaky, so they turn really, really bright white with the dye picture. Now, treatment of diabetic retinopathy, the main thing and the mainstay of treatment Besides the eye, is working with the you know either the internal medicine doctor, the endocrinologist, the family doctor, and making sure that the patient's blood sugars are under good control. If they need treatment in the eyes, the first thing I always tell my patients is that they need to keep their blood sugars, blood pressure under control. Otherwise, everything I do for their eye, they're basically undoing by not keeping good control of their blood sugars. Um, it's like the way I explain it is I'm trying to put the fire out, and they're putting gasoline into the fire if they're not keeping it under control. So this may seem very obvious to us now, but controlling the blood sugar is the cornerstone to, treatment, to uh, treating diabetes and preventing eye disease. Now there were several studies done uh, several years ago that before this was really proven, they had to do studies in order to basically prove it. And that's what they basically showed, is that the better control of the diabetes in both type 1 and type 2 diabetics, the less likelihood of developing eye disease or kidney disease. And once patients have the eye disease, the less likely it is that that eye disease will progress. In these next slides, um, there's a lot of words, but these are basically just the studies that, that found that. And the mainstay of treatment for those of you who are diabetics, you know, you check your blood sugar daily, but the most important thing is the blood test that your doctor does. It's called your hemoglobin A1C. Um, they don't do this test on patients that aren't diabetics, but on patients that are diabetics, it's a very important blood test that the doctor does every three or four months. And it shows what the patient's average blood sugar has been over the last three months. Um, so checking your blood sugars daily is important for maintaining control, but really that that blood test number is the most important because that's showing what the average is over three months. 
And the goal by the American Diabetic Association is that the hemoglobin A1C should be less than 7%. And I've heard some endocrinologists are now pushing for less than 6%. Um, and it's very difficult to keep it that control because then you're battling low blood sugar, which low blood sugar has side effects too. Patients can pass out, get lightheaded. Um, so keeping very strict control of your blood pressure or blood sugar is very difficult. Um, and then you also want to keep control of your blood pressure. And then they also recommend daily uh, exercise and dietary management as well. So blood sugar, blood pressure, and cholesterol, those are the big three things that all patients with diabetes we want under good control. If their blood sugars are under control but their blood pressure is out of control, their diabetic retinopathy will continue to progress. Now when we do see uh, disease in the eye, what do we do? In the past, the mainstay of treatment used to be laser. And now it's still one of the most common things that we do for diabetics, but now as someone in the audience had asked if we're using any injectable drugs, we do use injectable medications to treat diabetes um, adjunct with laser because laser is still the more permanent treatment. Basically, if the patient has swelling in the retina, you do laser uh, to treat the swelling. You want to target the laser to basically cauterize the abnormal areas of leaking blood vessels to get them to stop leaking. There's another medicine. She had mentioned Avastin, and I don't actually have the Avastin in my presentation, but it works similar to Kenalog. Um, this is basically a steroid injection to reduce uh, swelling. Um, the Avastin works similarly, it just works against a different chemical. And again, we use both of these uh, to inject into the eye to help with the, with the swelling in the retina. Now, it usually takes several injections. Uh, the patients who are getting the Avastin injection, usually the average is about 22 injections per eye. So I always have to explain to the patients, this isn't a one-time treatment. I wish I could give them one injection, treat it, and be done. But this is a series of injections every month for oftentimes for the rest of the patient's life in order to preserve their vision. And this just is a diagram of the injection into the eye. Now this picture here is similar to the one I showed you before. If you look at this bottom picture, there are these black spaces in the retina. That's the swelling in the retina. It's fluid in the retina. And after you treat the patient, as you can see, there's no more spaces in the retina. So the swelling went away after the treatment with the injection. Now what do we do when the patients start to get the blood vessels that bleed into the eye? Again, you can use the injections and laser. It's just a different type of laser that we do, but you basically want to get rid of all the areas of the retina that aren't getting enough blood flow because those areas are the ones that are producing these abnormal chemicals. So you apply laser to those areas uh, to help uh, decrease the, uh, their production of these abnormal chemicals that are leading to the blood vessel formation. And this is just a picture of the laser. These bright white spots here are the laser spots. Now somebody had mentioned surgery. There's basically two things that we do surgery for. One is the bleeding in the eye. And generally we allow about two to three months for the bleeding to clear up to see if it'll clear up on its own. It also depends on if the patient's had laser treatment in the past. If they haven't, I'm more likely to go to surgery sooner because you want to clear the blood out so that you can do laser. You can't use the laser in an eye if it's full of blood. Sometimes there's you know, a section of bleeding, and if, if you can get some laser and then you apply laser and wait for the blood to go away, if the blood doesn't go away, then you may have to do surgery. The type of surgery, it's called a vitrectomy. Um, I mentioned that the inside gel of the eye is called the vitreous. So the vitrectomy is just a cutting away and removing of the vitreous gel. And in that same process, you remove the blood um, and things as well. Now the other thing is the scar tissue that forms retinal detachment, this generally needs surgery. These membranes and scar tissue won't go away on their own. So if they're causing the retina to detach in an area that's affecting the patient's vision, you have to do the vitrectomy surgery where you go in, you remove Oftentimes they do have blood as well. You remove the blood, the vitreous gel, and then you peel these membranes and cut the membranes from, away from the surface of the retina so it stops causing the retinal detachment. Yes? Right. 
Right, so these, the scar tissue will, it pulls on the retina. It doesn't always have to cause the retina to detach. Um, the way I explain it to my patients is, if you think about your eye like this room, and imagine that there's wallpaper on the wall. The wallpaper on the wall is your retina. It basically lines the inside of your eyeball. So when it detaches, it's basically being peeled away from the wall. So, you know, somebody would be in the room basically pulling, you know, if I were the scar tissue, I'd be pulling the retina away from the wall. And that's what's called a retinal detachment, is when it's being pulled away like that. And once you release that scar tissue, the retina will basically settle back down and reattach itself. Yes, sir. No. <laughs> Do you mean, uh, I think you're referring to LASIK and things like that, is that what you mean? Or this laser? No, this, no. So what I always tell my patients is the laser we do is to prevent everything from getting worse. The laser doesn't generally improve the vision. If it's laser for the swelling, the goal is to stop the swelling so that the vision doesn't get worse. Oftentimes the patient's vision will get better. In the injections that we mentioned, those have been actually much better at improving patient's vision than the laser was. So that's why the, the injections have become a, a much more common treatment for, for diabetes now. The medications, there are some of the medicines that are very expensive. Um, generally it's covered by insurance. Um, the Avastin and the Kenalog that we mentioned here are less expensive. Um, but again, all of it is covered by insurance as well. If you guys have a question, can you please raise your hand so that we can bring the mic over to you, make sure that everyone can hear your question. Um, who was speaking? Who has a question, ma'am? Oh, I'm sorry to have another question, but I, because I'm still curious. I have, as I said, I have the detachment. I have that surgery you were talking about. I can't mm -hmm. never pronounce it. <laughs> and then after the surgery, they did a laser but I did lose more vision in the eye and they had told me that. And then after a year, it developed scar tissue uh, like a, a, a cataract and they had to remove the cataract. Right, so when we do our surgery, when we do that vitrectomy surgery where either we remove the blood or fix a retinal detachment, um, the patients always develop a cataract. It's just once you take out the vitreous gel in the eye, it changes the composition of the eye and the cataract, the lens of the eye. For those of you who don't know, a cataract is a discoloration of the lens of the eye. So it's like the lens of the camera focusing light into the eye. Um, and a cataract is basically as you get older, the, the lens uh, becomes cloudy and that's what's called a cataract. Um, in patients that have our surgery, the cataract develops more rapidly than it would have otherwise. So usually within a year or two, you would need cataract surgery, right? Okay, we have a question right here. Doctor, I'd like to know why that laser is so painful and the horrible lie they put it on your face. So the, I always tell my patients that if you can invent a way to look in the eye without a light, you'd be a billionaire. <laughs> um, and then the laser, so the reason in the wall of the eye, under the retina, there's a lot of nerves that run through the wall of the eye. And that's why the laser can be pretty painful at times. We, um, at the Retina Institute, we use a new type of laser that actually puts in, puts in 25 shots at one time. And it uses a lighter power and patients find it to be fairly comfortable. Most of my patients say that they didn't even really feel the laser. So. Uh. Uh, in 2008, they gave me in both eyes, and now they want to give it to me in the left eye, and I really uh, don't want it. Right. Well, I would definitely talk to your eye doctor. Um, you know, <laughs> what, I, what I'm saying. <laughs> right, right. Because you want to, yeah. But you want to make sure, you know, that the treatment, if it's going to prevent you from developing more severe disease where you might lose vision, I would definitely recommend it. I would definitely recommend following his advice. We have a question on this side of the room really quickly. Uh, doctor, on uh, removing the gel from the eye, how is it replaced or is it replaced with something else or what? So the, the gel in the eye is not needed anymore. It's almost like your appendix. It's what we call a vestigial substance or a vestigial organ. 
Um, so it's used during development when you're being, it, it's actually what forms the blood vessels in the eye. Uh, but once you're born, it's not really used for anything um, at that point. Um, so removing it doesn't do any harm to the eye or anything like that. Um, at the time of surgery, we infuse fluid into the eye, um, which is basically a salt-based type solution, which is similar to the fluid that's, that was in the eye before. Um, and once that goes away, your body replaces that fluid. The front part of your eye produces a fluid called the aqueous. So the aqueous fluid eventually just fills the whole eye. So your body produces the fluid. No, it does not cause the eyeball to collapse. The eye will still the the eye pressure is maintained by the aqueous even from even if you didn't have the vitreous gel removed, the eye pressure uh, that we measure in the office it's formed by the aqueous solution. Okay, so you had a question here. Yeah. Uh, what about uh, when uh, bleeding a lot inside? Bleeding in the eye. Bleeding in the eye. Yeah. When I bleed inside. Uh huh. What about the uh, I did a uh, uh, laser, but they not work, you know, that's a work. Right, so the, um, the laser, you know, if you have laser treatment when there's bleeding in the eye, the laser doesn't get rid of the blood. Your body will eventually reabsorb the blood, the lasers to try to prevent more bleeding. But the one thing that does commonly happen is right after the laser, you may have more bleeding in the eye. Because what happens is, the lasers getting those abnormal blood vessels to go away and when they start to shrivel up and go away they're very fragile so they'll often bleed as they're going away. Um, so I always warn my patients before doing the laser that they may have some more bleeding in the eye after the laser because I don't want them to necessarily think that I did this procedure and now they have more bleeding in the eye that we caused it. The, it is a result because the blood vessels are starting to go away. Um, but to get rid of the blood we either have to give it time or do a surgery to go in and remove the blood. Yeah, it sounds like you may have had some more bleeding in the eye right after the laser. Are we going to take a couple more questions, gentlemen? Can they put new lenses in your eyes and able to see? Um, so with cataract surgery, they remove the lens of the eye, and then they put um, a new lens in the eye, a fake lens in the eye. No, there's no guarantee, because if there's damage on the retina from the diabetes, no matter what lens you put in the eye, um, if the retina is not functioning, then you may not see any better, even with a new lens. Yeah. Any more questions? We're going to take one more question on the side of the room, Christine. Is there any cure for RP? Um, there, there are some forms of RP that are treatable, um, but generally, you know, if it's the inherited form that's not caused by something else, um, there, there is no cure currently. But the, um, it's called the, uh, blanket. I think it's called the, um, Talk to me afterwards. I'll look up and see what the uh, what the device at USC is that they've developed. Uh, the Argus too. That's right. Uh, retinitis pigmentosa. So generally, it's an inherited uh, disease where there's a degeneration of the retina. Yeah. Dr. Davis, can you take one more question? Yeah. Okay, last one. Okay. Just, um, just a comment. If you have to deal with the Vastin and insurance companies, I could tell you personally that the insurance companies will fight you with it at times because my husband and insurance paid, and then after a while they didn't want to. But I had a wonderful eye doctor who fought for me and then they had to, and they tried to say, well, she's put in a con situation where she's too young to have this uh, condition with uh, macular degeneration. And he said, no, she has a rare form. But if you fight with the insurance companies, they will pay, but you have to fight. If you want to get 
you know, them to, uh, to give you the advice, and you really have to fight. Because if your insurance company is not going to do it, trust me, fight to get your medication, to get their treatment. Because if you don't fight and they want you to pay that bill, it's a very expensive proposition. And I tell you, they're going to try everything they can not to pay it, but they have to pay it. Uh, please join me, everyone, in thanking Dr. Michael Davis from the Retina Institute of California for a great presentation. I think Dr. Davis will be staying around for a few minutes. We're going to take a short 10-minute break. Please be back in the room uh, in about 10 minutes. As I said, the rest of you are out of the doors and to the right. And if you haven't signed up for the raffle or the drawing, you can do that at the registration table in the lobby. See you in 10 minutes.
Okay, everyone, if we can have you start to take your seats, we're going to start the second half of our presentation fairly soon. with the second part of our presentation. If you're still out in the hall, can you please come back in and have a seat? We're gonna get started. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Uh, if you could take your seats, please. We're going to start the next part of our presentation. I just have a few quick announcements before we get started. As you know, Braille Institute's Low Vision Wellness Program is designed to help people with low vision continue to live independent, fulfilling lives. And as a part of our Low Vision Wellness series, we're going to be hosting a variety of events like this throughout the year on topics ranging from chronic disease management to using technology to regaining your confidence in the kitchen or anywhere else. So if you're not on our mailing list and you'd like to be added to our list to receive information about events in the future, please see someone at the registration table and they can make sure we add you to our mailing list. It's now my distinct pleasure to introduce our next presenter of the day, Yvette Caballero of Healthcare Partners Medical Group. Mrs. Caballero received her nursing degree from the University of Southern California. She's worked in various areas of the nursing profession, which include post-surgical recovery, oncology, pediatrics, newborn nursery, and emergency care. In 2005, she decided to focus on diabetes education and preventative care. She's participated in numerous community outreach events to increase public awareness of the importance of early prevention and intervention of diabetes. She's also been a guest speaker for various organizations throughout the community, including the UCLA School of Public Health, Charles Drew University, Esperanza Community Housing Group, the March of Dimes, and California Hospital Medical Center. She currently works for Healthcare Partners in Los Angeles as a certified diabetes educator. And today, Ms. Caballero will be discussing managing diabetes. So please join me in welcoming Yvette Caballero from Healthcare Partners. Thank you, and good morning. Good morning. How's everyone feeling this morning? Good, good. Okay, well, we're going to talk about diabetes and feelings about diabetes and self-care management, which is a challenge. So, um, the diagnosis of diabetes is an overwhelming diagnosis for many. Um, my patients come into my office feeling very anxious, um, sad, and we sit there and we talk about what's the next step. Now, some of the feelings that I encounter is that they're uncertain about what they're going to do. I have some patients who are very angry. I have some patients who have very positive feelings. They're go-getters. They want to learn as much as they can. They want their meter right away. They want to start checking their blood sugars like yesterday. Um, but I do have some other patients who are feeling very overwhelmed and need to just kind of go home and think about it. Um, if you're feeling frustrated, one of the things that I always recommend to my patients is that they go back and talk to their families about it, or if 
there um, alone to just sit and talk about what they want to do and what we're going to talk discuss the next the next visit that they come and see me. Can you all hear me? Good. All right. Okay. Okay, so some of the feelings that um, my patients experience are either anger, denial, depression, loneliness, or sadness. So what do you do? Again, um, seek support, talk to your families, relatives, friends. Um, if, you're, if you feel that you have a really good relationship with your doctor, talk to your doctor. Um, other professionals, um, seek help from your registered dietitian as well as um, certified diabetes educators. Um, take control. Learn more about managing your diabetes. Don't be afraid. Ask. And one of the things that the American um, uh, Association of Diabetes Educator has worked with is a framework. And this framework is to develop how we can manage our diabetes better. And we, we, we've labeled this the seven self-care behaviors. And the, the seven self-care behaviors are from the American Diabetes Association and as well as the American Association of Diabetic Educators. Is one is healthy eating, being active, taking your medications, monitoring blood sugars, problem solving, healthy coping, and reducing risk. Now, we're going to talk, talk about all seven of them, OK? And I know that um, we have a little bit of time constraint, but I'm really going to try to focus on um, the first four. So, healthy eating. Healthy eating involves a day-to-day -day decision about when we eat, what we eat, how much we eat. Now, factors that may influence our choices of, or feelings about eating can be eating habits, emotions related to food, eating patterns, and food availability. Now, I walked during the break, I walked over to see what they, um, the spread that they had for you today, and there were some nice choices there, okay? So, um, that was really interesting. Next slide. So, um, the slide that you're seeing right now, it says, it says, with all the diet books on the market, on, on the market, why aren't we skinny? And some of these books are labeled um, Diet Are Us, The Right Diet. I'm sorry, but I'm not tall. <laughs> uh, Diets of the Stars, uh, Diet Till You Drop. So why are we not skinny? Right? If, uh, we, all these books are being published. Well, because we need to go back to basics. We really need to concentrate on eating small portions, monitoring our serving sizes, try to eat healthier foods from the basic food groups, which I'm, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the basic food groups. This was taught early on in school that we need to eat a little bit of vegetables, fruits, a little bit of whole grains, dairy products, um, protein, as well as dairy. Um, vegetables in our diet. So you can see that it's important that we start building a, a, um, healthier choices and also a healthier plate for us. Now, one of the things that um, the American dietitian recommends is that you divide your plate in half, okay? And the, the half of the plate should be really more of the non-starchy non vegetables. For example, uh, broccoli, spinach, um, lettuce, radishes, celery sticks, that kind of non-starchy vegetables. Um, the other part of the, the, the plate should be divided in one, one portion of protein and the other portion should be a whole grain or high fiber grain. Next slide. Okay, so going back to basics again, a healthy diet includes basic food groups such as fruits and vegetables, whole grains, low fat dairy foods, fish, lean meats, poultry, and healthy fats. So some of the tips that I give my patients is I say, well, okay, let's take a look at what you're eating. Let's go over your food diary, okay? But a lot of times I'll sit with my patients and I'll ask them, okay, what did you have to eat yesterday for breakfast? So we talk about serving size. We also talk about portion control. And a lot of people um, have a distortion about what portion control is, as you can, as, as, um, as you can tell, some people, you know, you, you want more, a little bit more, a little bit more. Well, guess what? One serving equals to X amount of sugar you're eating. Another serving equals to another X amount of serving. So, you know, this adds up. So you could be eating anywhere between 20 to 30 to 40 grams of sugars and maybe eight um, ounces of, of milk. 
And in my slide, the woman wonders, as she sits to eat 25 grapefruits, she says, well, grapefruit, grapefruit burns off fat, doesn't it? Well, yes, it does, but not if you're going to eat 25, because you're going to eat a lot of sugar as well. Next slide. OK, so healthy eating again, which is one of our self-care behaviors. Back to basics. A serving side is defined as a fixed amount of food that provides a certain amount of nutrients. And the tip that I give to my patients is, well, you know, they really are not, they're not really excited about going out and buying measuring cups and having to measure everything. So I give them what, what I call the, um, the, the, uh, the, the hands of a unit measurement, which I say to them, OK, let's just take what is two ounces uh, to three ounces of uh, a size. Well, I say to them, look at your palm, OK, or feel your palm. Or if you can take a deck of cards, that's approximately two to three ounces okay, of protein. Um, one cup, if you're using the hands um, measurements, then you would say um, the size of your fist. Now, some patients say to me, well, you know, we have different size of fists, and that is true, but that's approximately. And then half a cup would be considered the size of a cupped hand. Going back to basics again, um, carbohydrates is something that you need to include in your diet. And many of my patients are surprised about that because they say, well, do you know, you know my doctor told me that I can't eat bread. My doctor told me I can't eat tortillas. Um, I got to stay away from rice, etc." Well, as we know, in every culture, sometimes starch is a staple of our foods. You know, we could probably eat rice, or maybe we eat pastas, or we, we eat breads or tortillas. So a variety of things are included in different cultures. So what I say to my patients, I say, well, OK, um, what is it that you like? If you like white rice, then reduce the portion. Or if you like to eat a little bit of more rice, then why don't you choose brown rice instead? Well, we kind of negotiate back and forth. They try it. I give them a little bit of recipes. Or sometimes, if they're really struggling, I'll refer them to the registered dietitian so they, they can work with them at an individual level so they can plan a meal for, for my patients. So one of the recommendations that I also give to my patients, and I ask them to use it as a self-care tip, is to space the carbohydrates that they eat throughout the day not eat all the carbohydrate at once. Um, some of my patients, the, the, um, I usually predominantly see a lot of Latino uh, patients in my clinic, and they tend to eat a lot of tortillas. Well, if they're eating six tortillas, that is approximately anywhere between 45 to 65 grams of sugar that they're eating. So I say to them, why don't you reduce it to maybe two tortillas in the morning, two tortillas in the afternoon for lunch, and then maybe two tortillas uh, for dinner, instead of having six tortillas in the morning with your breakfast. Another another tip, another tip that I and that I that I recommend my patients in regards to the self care and healthy eating is to eat less processed foods um, and try to cook their vegetables less. So if you can go, if you, or you can option for um, steamed broccoli versus cooked broccoli is better. You get more of the fiber. It's healthier for you. And thirdly. Reducing your dietary um, saturated fats and your trans fats in your diet is a very good tip to self-manage also your, um, your cholesterol and your triglycerides. Um, if you don't mind because of time constraints, I'm going to leave the questions until last. Thank you. So another tip for uh, self-care management and, eating and healthy eating, remember that meals are individualized. It is a good idea to monitor your blood glucose sugar. OK, I'm sorry, your blood, your, monitor your blood glucose. Glucose is also known as sugar before your meals and after your meals. This practice depends, um, this practice helps determine your own response to particular foods. And this is very important. Um, most of the time with my patients, and this is something that Dr. Davis mentioned, is that we don't know how long you've had diabetes. Maybe you haven't had a, a checkup for a long time. So you've probably had it for four years, five years. We don't know. Sometimes we have a lot of patients that walk into our clinics because of symptoms that they're having. So at that time, they're diagnosed. Now, because of this, we don't know how long your pancreas 
um, has not been producing insulin, if there's a, an insulin deficiency or if there's actually an insulin resistance that you're having. So for that reason, a lot of times I say to my patients, you know, checking your blood sugar will really give you an idea if you have enough insulin to metabolize, to process that sugar you just had in that particular meal. So it's a good practice. However, it's easier said than done. Because for other of my patients, they're, you know, they're, they're fearful of needles or for some reason or another, there's some kind of barrier that doesn't allow them to um, check their sugars at home. Um, a registered dietitian or a diabetes certified educator can assist with individualized planning. And I really recommend that um, patients try to attend at least one diabetes nutrition class or at least meet with a registered dietitian so they can work on an individual, individualized plan. Okay, the second, the second um, self-care behavior that is addressed is also being active. Now, I always recommend my patients that they consult with their doctor first before they um, start any type of program. Walking is usually the most common prescribed activity and the most likely to be successful because of both safety and accessibility. Patients with diabetes should set activity goals based on what they find useful to them. Um, it's important that you find an exercise that works for you. And one of the things that um, it's, it's encouraging is to find a type of exercise that you enjoy. Um, set the frequency, the duration, the intensity. For example, if you decide that your type of exercise is going to be walking, then say to yourself, okay, I'm going to walk how many times a day, how many times during the week, for how long, and the intensity. So an example would be, I'm going to walk for three days a week, five to 10 minutes, and it's gonna be a brisk walk. So this is considered self-managing because you're setting your own goals and you're really measuring what you're capable of doing. A gradual increase uh, of duration and frequency and intensity of walking to meet your goals is important. It's important that you evaluate yourself, how you're feeling every week, and say to yourself, okay, I've reached my goal of walking three times a week for five to 10 minutes, brisk walk. Now what am I gonna do the following week or for the next two weeks? So this is considered setting your own self goals. Being active. Also it's important for you to discuss this with your doctor as well as your certified diabetes nurse educator or your registered dietitian because many of my patients are on insulin or sometimes are also on insulin producing medications which are considered segregogs. And when you start an active program or any type of physical activity and you're taking medications that produce insulin, you could have low blood sugars and this is considered hypoglycemia. By definition, hypoglycemia is 70. Any blood sugar result of 70 or less is considered a low blood sugar, and it should be treated. Now, usually what I teach my patients is to use the 15-15 rule, which means that you are going to treat it with 15 grams of carbohydrate. You're going to check your blood sugars in 15 minutes, and if your sugar is still below 70, you're going to eat an additional 15 grams of carbohydrate. Monitoring your sugar before the activity is a good practice as well as after. It's important that if you're going to start any type of physical exercise that you keep an accurate, detailed record of blood sugars. Um, also, if you're taking any medications, if you took the medication before or after, and then the type of snack in activity in intensity and duration that was involved in your physical activity. Once again, hypoglycemia. By definition, hypo means low, glycemia means blood. Hypoglycemia or low blood sugar occurs when a blood sugar is less than 70. Now I do have to say that some patients um, have experienced low blood sugars based on symptoms. And what they say to me is that my blood sugar was 80 or 90 and I start shaking. So sometimes it can be individual. Some common um, signs and symptoms of mild to moderate hypoglycemia include tremors, sweating, dizziness, palpitations, and sudden hunger. 
And just to review again how you treat hypoglycemia, once again, the 15-15 rule is um, to treat a low blood sugar with 15 grams of carbohydrate, for example, eight ounces of milk, four ounces of juice. Um, I always encourage my patients that they carry some um, uh, glucose tablets, and usually it's three glucose tablets, glucose gels, and if you're out and about, you should also carry some um, hard candies or jelly beans. After 15 minutes of, uh, after 15 minutes of um, the, uh, the juice that you drink, it's important that you check your blood sugar again. And once again, if your blood sugar is still low, you need to drink or eat 15 grams of carbohydrate. It is important to know that sometimes when people begin a healthy diet, they experience symptoms similar to those for low blood sugar. If your blood is currently normal, you previously suffered from high blood sugar, you may experience low blood sugar symptoms. It is normal to experience these symptoms because the body, the body is adjusting. Now this is very, very common with my patients. I have some patients that come in with blood sugars of 300, 400. Um, I refer them to the registered dietitian. They start working on a diet plan. Um, they start reducing their portions. All of a sudden, their blood sugars drop to 200, and then gradually they start dropping to 100, 130, and they say, well, I feel horrible now, and I'm following the diet. Well, what we do is we talk about their medications. Have you adjusted the medications? Have you seen your doctor? And the reality is that sometimes patients don't come back to see the, their doctors three or maybe four months later. So at that time, I say, okay, well, remember, when you were given that medication, your blood sugars were 300, 400. So we need, really need to evaluate the amount of dose that you're taking now because now your sugars are under control. So when you're thinking about um, physical activity, it's important that you set a plan for yourself. What type of acti activity do you want to do and something that you're gonna enjoy? We uh, recommend that you, um, that you think about stretching, aerobic exercises if you can, and straightening the exercises are very recommended as well. Uh, remember always to consult your physician before starting any type of exercise activity. Physical activity has many benefits. It reduces blood sugar during and immediately after the activity, improves insulin sensitivity, helps with weight loss and weight maintenance, increases muscle mass, and decreases fat, body fat. It also reduces your hemoglobin A1C. And if you recall, Dr. Davis talked about the A1C. It's a measuring type of exam. It's a blood work that's usually done every three to four months. And um, it's a standard guideline practice that the physicians ask the patients to come in twice a year and the, their bloods are drawn. And usually this, this, um, this result is given to the patients and it's really a benchmark for them. Taking medications is our third self-care behavior. And it's important, again, that you understand that diabetes is a chronic illness. So as the years progress, the disease progresses as well. So we need to reevaluate your medication, your dosages. And some of the questions that you want to ask your doctor or have a conversation with him is, if you're not taking your medications the way it should be, why is it that you're not taking your medications? Are you having any side effects? Do you feel that maybe this medication is not working for you? Um, the other thing that is very important to my, to my patients is also the availability of the medications. Are they able to obtain the medications because of cost? Medic, diabetic medications can be very expensive depending on the insurance coverage that you have. I have some patients who come in and say to me, well, you know, um, I was injecting Lantus, but I stopped injecting because I can't buy it. So, of course, you know, if you're not treating yourself, then your blood sugars are going to be high. For some patients, it's just, uh, it's probably just they forget. So one of the things that I, I discuss with my patients is I say, well, let's talk about why you're forgetting to take your medications. Is it because you're carrying around a big bag with all of your medications, or do you have them organized? So these are some of the things that sometimes we really need to just sit down and discuss with the patients and take the time to understand what their needs are. My suggestion is a pill box. Um, if you can, maybe write it on a calendar. For some people, if you have maybe an, a, watch, a watch with an alarm that reminds you that you need to take your medications. Um, it's important also to update your list periodically, just in case of an emergency. Um, 
it's also, if you can, and I know for some patients this is very difficult, if you could have one pharmacy that you get your prescriptions, that would be ideal. You can get all your prescriptions from one place and you don't have to be going from one place to the other and it's, it's more convenient for the patient. Um, I've put up a website here that's a fabulous website. It's www.mustforseniors.org. It gives you tips on what you can do in order for you to have more accessibility to medications as well as tips on how to take your medications. The other um, website I've put up here is www.ahrq.gov, um, Consumer Check Meds. It also talks about a little bit of medications that are out there and some of the side effects if you have any questions. The other thing is there's a lot of new products out here um, in California that have um, been put out by a lot of the pharmacies that are user friendly. And I'm just going to put it close to the microphone, see if you can hear it. This is in Spanish, unfortunately, I'll, I'm out of my um, English. <laughs> okay. So, you know, if you have, t if you, if you, if you have trouble, um, if you have trouble understanding how to inject diabetes, we have this. Lávese las manos. Verifique la etiqueta del flex pen para asegurarse que va a usar el tipo correcto de insulina. Destape la pluma y limpie el tapón de goma con algodón. So it's a voice that takes you step by step. It's kind of like the greeting cards that they sell at Hallmark. It takes you step by step, letting you know how you inject, what to do, once you get started on insulin. And a lot of times for, this pa for, for patients, this is very helpful because we can give them instructions, we can demonstrate to them how to inject their insulin, but once they get home, they forget. Okay, another of the um, self-care behaviors is self-monitoring blood sugar. And this helps a person with diabetes learn how to eat healthier, exercise and medication, and how this affects your blood sugar. Now, if you recall, I discussed about serving size. Serving size really affects your blood sugars after meals. So if you're checking after your, after your meals and you see that your blood sugar is above your target level, then it's because maybe you need either to adjust your medication or possibly adjust the amount of food that you're eating. Exercise. Exercise will also um, help you utilize your insulin better. So if you're not eating properly, sometimes your sugar can go a little low. And um, if you want to check your blood sugar after you've exercised, that's a really good practice as well. Self-monitoring also helps you identify problem areas and figure out ways to solve them. So again, this goes back to adjusting your portion size or also adjusting your medication. Self-monitoring can also help you um, identify high and low blood sugars. It'll also, see, um, it'll also um, help you identify um, physical activity, whether your blood sugar is going low. Um, also, it'll let you know that um, if you're having a little bit of stress, and a lot of patients come into my office letting me know, well, you know, I've had a lot of stress this week, and my sugars just are completely out of control. And I do say to them, yes, it is true. Um, this does, the stress does affect your blood sugars. So in, during the time that you're having a stressful situation, I recommend my patients to um, check their blood sugars a little bit more frequently. Um, uh, again, self-monitoring um, blood sugar will help you in terms of adjusting your medication doses. So if you're feeling that um, you started off with maybe five milligrams twice a day and all of a sudden you're seeing that your blood sugars are dropping, then maybe you, know, you want to have a discussion with your doctor and let them know, well, you know, doctor, I was taking uh, five milligrams twice a day and I've noticed that my blood sugar continuously is dropping. So what do you think? Should we maybe just adjust this medication or maybe should I stop taking my morning medication or my afternoon medications? So once again, these are self-care um, tips that empower you to have discussions with your providers. Okay, so this is just a schedule sample of how you should test. Um, now you don't need to be testing three, four times a day. Um, what I recommend my patients that initially they test at least twice a day for one week, but different times during the day. So I recommend that they test either before or after their breakfast, the following day to test before or after their lunch, and then the third day for them to test before or after dinner. If they're having low blood sugars throughout the night, then I usually um, recommend that they set their alarm for 2 to 3 o'clock in the morning and to test at 3 o'clock in the morning.
Monitoring your blood sugars, well, we need to know the normal values. So here they are. In the morning when you wake up and you check your blood sugars, the fasting, is, the fasting normal is 70 to 230 milligrams deciliter. Before meals, if you're checking before meals, it should be less than 140. And two hours after your meals, it should be less than 180. Now, these are the standard recommendations. Um, you also want to talk to your doctor about it if you're experiencing um, low blood sugars throughout the night, which could be, again, um, less than 70. Now, this is the most difficult part for some of my patients, is choosing the meter that, best, that is best for them. One of the things that you want to keep in mind, or a few factors to think about when you're choosing a meter, is the size, the shape, the portability, testing procedures. For example, does it require a, a large blood sample or a small blood sample? Um, economic factors, the cost of strips, lancets, and also um, special features. Does the device have special features? For example, voice readout. Um, does it require larger strips? Do you need larger strips? Also, do you need a one-handed lancet device? Um, Additional tips to self-monitoring. It's important also that you check your test strips for their expiration date. I do have patients who, um, for some reason, they just, you know, they, they, they don't know that the, the test strips have an expiration date. I've had patients come into my office last year with um, test strips that were from 2008. You know, and they're wondering why their blood sugars were so high or just not reading right. So make sure that you check the expiration date on the uh, test strips. Verify that the test, the test strip code and meter are the same. We have um, meters that you need to program with the code um, that need to match also the, the test strips. It's important that you wash your hands before you uh, test. And also, you want to at least calibrate your meter once a week. It's a blood, it's a blood um, a glucose control solution that you use, and you can ask um, either the diabetes educator or the physician to assist you with that. Or if you are buying your meter from a pharmacy, then you can also ask the pharmacist, and maybe they'll be able to help you and explain to you how you use the control solution. But usually, the the certified diabetic educator is more than willing to show you. Okay. Um, some additional tips and monitoring. Um, I have a lot of patients that come in my office and say, well, you know, I've heard of this new machine. You know, they stay up late watching infomercials at night, and they say, what is this new machine that um, I don't need to prick my finger? I don't need to stick my finger. Okay, well, they say that you don't need to stick your finger. You don't need to prick your finger. However, you do need a sample of blood. Where it comes from, it could be an alternative site. And some of the alternative sites that they recommend are the forearm, the palm of the hand, upper arm, or thigh. However, these alternative sites are not recommended when you're checking for hypoglycemia, if you're testing how your insulin works, usually during the peak time of insulin, if you're trying to test, do not use an alternative site, as well as during or after physical activity, during illness or before driving. And that's really important that you um, remember that, OK? An alternative, alternative site, it's, it's OK to use it, with the exception of the things I just mentioned. OK. Another self-care um, behavior that we recommend is also reducing the risk. As you, um, as you heard um, Dr. Davis mention, there's a lot of things that, um, that causes um, lost vision. And um, one of the things is um, out of control blood sugars. Okay, that's the major thing, as well as um, controlling your blood pressure. So we recommend that diabetes self-care management um, really focuses on monitoring your self-care by becoming familiar with important tests. For example, your A1C, which Dr. Davis mentioned, as, uh, as well as your numbers when it comes to your blood pressure and your cholesterol levels. Um, I have a very nice booklet. And it's out in, um, in the entrance at the table. It's called Know Your ABCs, and you're more than welcome to pick one up. Part of reducing your risks, um, controlling your blood sugar can lower risk, pro risk of problems or complications related to diabetes. 
out of control blood sugars affects the circulatory system and it usually affects the cardiovascular system, retinopathy, nephropathy, and neuropathy. Prevention, the best way to reduce these risks and complications is to strictly control your, your blood glucose, your high blood pressure, and your cholesterol. Self-care management is an important component of diabetes. Once again, Dr. Davis uh, mentioned that it's important that you um, have a yearly checkup of your eyes, identify problems with barriers to self-care, discuss um, uh, self-monitoring with your provider or your diabetes nurse educator, discuss nutrition education, physical activity, weight management, foot care, and exams are recommended once a year. Dental care is recommended at least twice a year or more often if there's dental or gum disease and also eye exams annually, as well as vaccinations. Tips for good foot care. Um, one of the things that you want to do is make sure you check your, foot, your feet and toes daily for cuts, bruises, or swelling. Touch, feel. If you feel anything, make sure that you let your, your provider know as soon as possible. It's important that you wear comfortable shoes and socks that fit well. Don't wear stockings that are too tight. Um, use lotion to avoid dry feet, but don't use them between your toes. Wash and dry your feet every day. Use warm water and mild soap. Make sure that you file your, your toenails straight across. Now this is, you, you're going to file your, your toenails, not cut your toenails, okay? There's a difference. And make sure that you do not go barefoot. Reducing the risk. Once again, poorly controlled diabetes can cause severe gum disease. So some of the tips that I give my patients in regards to dental care is brush and flaw your teeth with a soft toothbrush after meals. Use dental floss once a day to remove bacteria from between your teeth. Call your dentist if you have bleeding, sore gums, or persistent bad taste in your mouth. Quit smoking. Schedule a dental visit every six months for dental checkups, and be sure to inform your dentist that you have diabetes or any other medical conditions. So take control over your diabetes. Additional tips for some of my patients is meditation, relaxation, cope with the psychosocial issues by means of attending support group or classes, and form a cl close partnership with your care health partner. Now, um, the next two slides are problem solving and healthy coping, which is a challenge. Um, first of all, awareness of the problem. Awareness of the problem indicates a patient comes in and they've been told they're, they're diagnosed with diabetes. The next is, are they ready for change? That's the biggest, biggest challenge. Are they ready for change? For some of my patients, when they come in, like I said, feelings have a lot to do with um, how we're going to approach the treatment. What is the patient willing to do? And that's very important. When my patients come into my office, I, I always ask them, well, how are you feeling? And what is the next step? What are you willing to do? And we work from there. It's really a collaborative um, treatment. Um, it's what the patient is willing to do. Uh, we talk about goal setting, we talk about goals and contracts. Will you be able to change your diet? If you're not ready then, what are you willing to do now? Healthy coping is the other component of this. Once again, what is the patient's basic needs right now? Maybe the patient doesn't want to talk about medication. Maybe the patient doesn't want to talk about self-monitoring. Maybe the patient just wants to talk, wants to be listened, listened to. How is, how is a person adjusting to the diagnosis? It goes back again to the feelings that the person is, uh, is having at the moment of the diagnosis. And social, social support, um, again, look for friends, family, relatives, um, your healthcare provider. Seek some kind of support. Um, it's a difficult diagnosis, it is a change of life, a change of lifestyle, and it's, it's a struggle. It's a, it's a struggle for people. So once again, I always tell my patients, you know, come back, talk to me, um, call me, we can talk about it. If you're struggling meeting your goals, then it's, it's a step-by-step -step process. So just to discuss some of the things that I encounter in my office is 
this is a particular case, the case manager handed the chart over to the nurse and said, I don't understand why this patient will not test his blood sugar. He, he's had diabetes for 10 years. The nurse went into the room and sat with the patient, took, a, took out a meter and explained how to test his blood sugar. The patient said, well, I had been wondering how my blood was supposed to get into that tiny machine. So, you know, this could cause a lot of frustration. And you can see this patient has had diabetes for 10 years. So again, how was this patient coping with the diagnosis? And was there any problem solving on either side of the, of the situation? Probably not if this patient had diabetes for 10 years is when not checking his blood sugars. So um, feel, feel the power and control of taking care of your diabetes. And um, I want to thank you. And if you have any questions. If you have questions, just raise your hand. I'll come by with the mic. Uh, okay, one second, sir. Do you recommend those uh, tests that you put on your arm without poking yourself? Well, you still, you still have to poke yourself. You still need a blood sample. Right, right. What they, what they advertise on TV is that you don't have to um, stick your finger but they never, they, they never mention anything about not sticking another area or poking another area. Yeah. Hi, good morning. You still need the strip, yes. Hi, good morning. You had mentioned for the alternate sites um, not to use them if you're going to drive. Why is that? Because if you drive and um, you, you, if you check your blood sugar with an alternative site, it's not accurate. So you could probably have a lower blood sugar, and you don't want to get behind the wheel with a low blood sugar of 70. You mentioned uh, something about trans fats. Would you explain what trans fats are? Well, I can give you the short version. If you want a longer version, um, I can look it up for you and, and, and uh, talk to a registered dietitian. But trans fats, it's more of a, a, it's, it's a lipid, it's a molecule that enters your bloodstream faster. Is that oil? Grease or something? It's, it's, um, it's saturated fat. So it's like butter. Any, anything that is a hard oil, it's considered a fat. Okay. You have a question? Oh. Uh, hi. I have a um, low vision, so it's really hard to get the blood on the strip where it needs to go. Do you have any suggestions on how to do that? Yeah. Um, let me talk to you afterwards. Yeah. Any other questions on this side of the room? Good afternoon. My name is Marco. Um, Good afternoon. My question, ma'am, is I get dizzy a lot. Does that pertain only to low blood sugar, or is it both low and high blood sugar? That's a very good question. Um, one of the things you may want to discuss with your, with your physician is checking your blood pressure in different positions. So have him check your blood pressure while you're sitting down, while you're laying down, and also while you're standing. Because the, possibly you may be having some symptoms associated with cardiovascular problems associated with diabetes. So it can be associated with your heart um, as well as um, low blood sugars. But you want to be able to clarify that. Is it because you're having a low blood sugar or is it because maybe there's some problems with your circulatory system? Very good question. Any other questions? Okay, any other questions in the room? Okay, this oh, lady right okay. here. <laughs> okay, ma'am, hang on one second. I'm coming. Sorry, I'm just going to walk in front here. Okay. Hello. Uh, it has been said that carbohydrates is converted to sugar, and I like to eat carbohydrates. So is that true, and how much carbohydrates can I eat? And this uh, diet sometimes recommend low carbs. You know? 
Yes, it's true. Now, um, carbohydrates do convert into sugar. If you choose a carbohydrate that has fiber, then what you're doing is you're eating less carbohydrates. Um, it's not going to impact your blood as much. And how much you should eat? Well, again, if you monitor your blood sugars, and that kind of gives you an idea of how much you should be eating. But the standard, the standard recommendation is 45 grams for breakfast, 60 for lunch, and for dinner. And in between, you can have 15 to 30 grams of uh, carbohydrates for um, just snacks. Sure. Okay. All right, last question on this side of the room. Hang on one second, ma'am. Go ahead. How much exercise do you have to do a day? Well, I usually recommend about 20 minutes, starting off with 20 minutes, and then gradually increasing to 60 minutes if you can. OK, if there's no further questions, everyone please join me in thanking Yvette Caballero from Healthcare Partners for her great presentation. <laughs> Thank you for your attention, and have a wonderful day. Hey, that's going to stay with us for just a few more seconds, but really first, we're, you know we have two raffles going on. So I'd like to take this time to introduce and welcome to the stage Mark Greggett from Enhanced Vision, who's going to be doing the drawing for the Pebble Magnifier today. I see we have some Enhanced Vision fans in the crowd. <laughs> All right, so Mark's going to tell you a little bit more about the Pebble. Hey, everybody, how are you? Is anybody here? How are you? There you are. Hi, everybody. I see a lot of friendly faces in here. It's an honor to be able to help you. I'm Mark. Uh, my, I'm an exclusive distributor for Enhanced Vision. Uh, my company is called Los Angeles Low Vision. And I want to first, first and foremost thank Braille. Humbly thank Braille. You guys are fantastic. I um, want to thank Dr. Davis from Retina Institute of California. A uh, very, very humble, humble appreciation to all of you for letting me into your houses and help you and, and be able to change your life. Um, what we're doing right now is, is we have a few products in the other room if you want to take a look at them. We've really modified some of, the, some of the new products where they can actually read back to you now. So if it's very difficult for you to read, uh, it, it's, it's tough for you to make things a little bit too big, uh, now they'll read back to you aloud. If you want to watch TV, if you want to put your makeup on, all these different life skills, we have some new products in the other room that can help you out. Um, that being said, one of my favorite, favorite things to do is giving things away. <laughs> so that being said, we're going to go ahead and give away one of our portable devices. Uh, this is brand new, has two-year warranty. Uh, as, as I always joke, as most of you have heard, is if you, if you throw it in the ocean, you set it on fire, we'll come out and replace it for free. <laughs> so we definitely stand by our products. And Courtney, if you want to do the honors. And what's the value on the Pebble? Uh, the, pe the Pebble, the one I'm giving away is about, is about $600. Okay. okay. And it goes to... Courtney Castle. Oh, wait, c come on. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> and let's see here. I actually can't read this. Uh, I think, is, it, is there an Yvonne Wagoner? Oh, okay. There she is, Yvonne. Come on up. All right, here you go. Not a problem. We're going to take a quick photo of Yvonne, and then we'll move on to the next raffle item. We're going to make Yvonne famous. <laughs> Round of applause for Yvonne, please. Yay. Yay. Come on up, Andy. Yeah, I'll get on this side. Okay. Perfect. All right. Thank you guys All right. so much. And we're going to 
to just borrow Enhanced Vision's lockbox here to pick our next uh, few wa raffle drawing winners. But before I do, I just want to make a quick reminder so everyone knows that there is a community information fair right next door. The double doors to the exhibit hall are open right um, out to the right side of this, um, this room. And if you want to visit them, there's the Department of Aging is there. The National Research Institute is doing blue blood glucose screening today and blood pressure screening. So if you want to get your sugar checked or your blood pressure checked, we're doing that today. We're also doing free low vision consultations today with our low vision rehabilitation specialists. There's a table and our mobile unit is outside so you can get a consultation either in the room or on our mobile unit. So see one of our specialists, the American Diabetes Association is here today, Scan Health Plan and the Gas Company. So there's a lot of great resources next door for you. But first we're going to do our next raffle drawing with Yvette from Healthcare Partners. Okay, so the winner is Wallace Wagner. Wallace? Wallace Wagner? Oh, the Wagner family is wrapping it up. Oh. Today. <laughs> okay, I'll take that back soon. Okay. Okay, I'll shuffle this a little bit. I think it's Danny Tavias. Danny? Danny? Roland Anderson. Roland Anderson? <laughs> okay, next. Gloria Brenberry. <laughs> Antonio Cruz? Antonio Cruz? Okay, last one, last one. Alicia or Alice Hall? Alice Hall? Alice Hall, okay. Congratulations, Alice. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you all for coming today. We really appreciate you coming out to the diabetes seminar. We will be doing our next big eye disease seminar in May on macular degeneration. And we're going to have a technology fair associated with that on both mainstream and adaptive, te adaptive technology. So if you're interested in apps, iPhones, computers, we're going to do a big tech fair after that one in May. So make sure you're on the mailing list and you'll get the flyer for those upcoming events. So thank you for coming today, and please visit the exhibit hall next door.